Hello, I am Björn Tegman from Definity. This is a presentation on identity and authentication on the internet computer. Before diving into the technical details of the features we have built, let me explain what I mean by identity and authentication and why we do things differently on the internet computer than on the traditional web. When you log into a website today, you're likely asked for a username and password. Your username, nowadays most often your email address, serves as your identity, the unique identifier that connects all the data on the servers to you. Your password is the means of authentication. Since only you should know your password, the server takes your ability to enter the password as a proof that it is communicating with you. It turns out that passwords, despite their wide use, are actually not a good mechanism for remote authentication. We'll touch on some of the reasons later, but I want to start with one right now. When you enter your password on a website, your computer sends the password to the server, where it is checked against the password database. If you follow IT news, you've certainly seen lots of headlines about attackers extracting the password databases from company A or service provider B. The passwords are not necessarily stored in the clear. If they are, such an event is of course catastrophic. But even when industry best practices are followed, such as only storing a so-called salted hash of the password, recovering passwords from such a user database is only a matter of computational and thus monetary resources that an attacker is willing to invest. The internet computer is designed to provide security against malicious behavior of individual compute providers by replicating data and computation across multiple data centers. Replication, while protecting the integrity of the data, does not protect against leakage of information and thus the use of passwords on the internet computer would still be subject to the same security issues as on the traditional web. Thus, we replace passwords by proper cryptographic authentication. The main cryptographic mechanisms we use for authentication on the internet computer is a digital signature scheme. Digital signatures are a pretty standard concept. They have been invented in the late 70s and are widely used at least since the mid 90s. They are generally thought of as consisting of three algorithms. The first one is key generation, which you can think of as an analog for choosing a password. Key generation creates a pair of keys, a private key that has to be kept secret, just like a password, and a public key that is derived from the private key, but can be made public. The second algorithm is signing. It takes a message and the private key and produces a signature. When we use digital signatures for user authentication, this algorithm is run on the user side where the private key is held. The third algorithm is verification. It takes the message, the signature and the public key and verifies whether the signature matches the message and public key. The crucial property here is that unlike when checking a password, which requires the secret password and the clear on the server, the verification of a signature can be performed merely on public information. The server stores a list of public keys, one for each user, and neither the public key nor the signature have to remain secret. If you watched our overview videos, you remember that applications on the internet computer are implemented based on canisters that interact by passing messages. In a bit more detail, the interaction model is based on requests which are a lot like remote procedure calls. When canister A calls canister B, A specifies the target canister, which is B, the name of the function it intends to call, and the arguments for the function. When the specified function is evaluated on B, B also uh, is also aware that the function was invoked by canister A. After the evaluation is complete, a obtains the return value of the function as a response. The same remote procedure model applies when a user calls a canister. The user sends a request to the target canister. This request also specifies a function with arguments and the user obtains the return value as a response. During the evaluation of the request, the canister also learns the identity of the user invoking it. This slide shows a schematic view of a request sent from a user. The light gray area in the middle shows the core request, the target cancer ID, the function name, 
the arguments and the identity or principle of the caller. The darker gray area shows the envelope that contains the authentication information, the signature and the public key. As shown on the left hand side, the caller's principle is derived by hashing from the public key. This technique is used widely in the blockchain space, such as in Bitcoin or Ethereum addresses. The right hand side shows how the request contents as a message in a digital signature scheme is bound to the public key via the signature. When the internet computer receives such a request, it checks both whether the signature is valid under the specified public key, as well as the relation between the public key and the caller principle to ensure that the message was indeed sent by the caller specified in the message. The canister does not have to bother with those technical details. If everything checks out, the internet computer simply evaluates the specified function on the canister. If one of the checks fails, the request is simply dropped. I'd like to mention a few details about the format of the principles we use. We start with a public key, encode it in DER format, and use SHA-224 as a hash function, resulting in a 28-byte string. We append a single byte that only serves to differentiate principles derived from public keys from ones we use elsewhere in the internet and computer, such as for canisters. Those 29 bytes are the internal binary representation of a user's principle. When converting a principle to its textual representation, we first prepend a CRC32 error detection code. We then encode the resulting string in base32 and finally build groups of five characters each separated by dashes. The format has been chosen to support easy copy pasting with appropriate error detection, while still allowing for less than 64 characters ASCII representation for comp compatibility with internet protocols such as DNS. The scheme we've seen up to here is still a bit inflexible as by construction, it binds the user's principle to a single cryptographic key. This restriction makes it difficult for a user to interact with canisters from different devices, as that would require to share the same cryptographic key between those devices, which is both tedious and discouraged from a security perspective. Instead, we use delegations between different cryptographic keys. On this slide, you see a delegation from the yellow key to the orange key. You can think of the yellow key as delegating the right to use the principle derived from itself to the orange key. Such a delegation consists of the delegate key, the orange one, some additional parameters such as an expiration or a restriction of the scope of the delegation, and a signature of the delegating key, the yellow one. When signing a request with the orange key, a user can now include the delegation from the yellow key in order to use the identity derived from the yellow key. What is particularly powerful about delegations is that they can be composed. The orange key can extend the delegation to, say, the purple key. If all that seems familiar from the public key infrastructure and X509, it is. We're using just more lightweight data structures. One specific application of delegations is related to web authentication. Web authentication is a recent standard of the World Wide Web Consortium and mainly targets two-factor authentication for web applications. The motivation for this standard is that, as indicated earlier, passwords have severe security deficiencies. Whether via phishing emails or malware installed on user devices, or by breaking into service, as mentioned earlier, they often fall prey to cyber criminals. Second-factor authentication means that besides the password, Logging in to a web application also requires an additional security factor, usually a security device that the user owns. In practice, that could be a secure USB key or a secure chip that is built into the user's end device and activated via biometrics. The secure chip stores cryptographic keys. As the cryptographic keys never leave the secure chip, they remain secure, even if the user's computer or phone is infected with malware. When web authentication is used as a second factor in a web application, the protocol flow is as follows. After the user initiated the login process by providing username and password, the web server will generate a random challenge and send it to the user's browser. The browser then sends the challenge to the secure device, which requires user interaction before it signs the challenge. 
The signed challenge is then sent back to the server, which verifies the signature on the challenge relative to the user's registered public key. This ensures that logging into the web application requires holding the secure device in addition to the password. We build on the fact that web authentication is an open standard that uses digital signatures for authentication and is already supported on a broad range of devices. When adapting it for the internet computer, though, we had to overcome a few hurdles. Web authentication assumes the session-oriented client-server model of the traditional web, where a user authenticates once when logging in with the application and sends subsequent messages within the same session. The internet computer, by contrast, implements a model where each request is authenticated individually. In particular, there is no server that can generate a challenge to be signed by the security device, as there is no stateful session between the browser and the internet computer. Recall, however, that in the typical web authentication flow, the secure device provides a digital signature on the challenge sent by the server. To implement request authentication using the same protocol, we simply use the request itself as the challenge and have it signed by the secure device, analogous to our general request authentication scheme. Another issue that we had to overcome is that web authentication requires user interaction for every signature. But in typical front ends served by the internet computer, a single page load can correspond to multiple requests. As we do not want to require the user to explicitly confirm each such request, we use the delegation mechanism described before. When interacting with a canister using web authentication, we first generate a short-term session key. We then use web authentication to sign a delegation toward that session key so a single user interaction can trigger multiple requests to the internet computer. While web authentication is great for storing keys securely, it binds those keys not only to the device, but also to the particular canister. The reason for this is the browser security model, which strictly separates the state accessible to different applications running in the same web browser by their so-called origin. On the web, you can think of an origin as roughly corresponding to one website. On the internet computer, each origin corresponds to one canister. This strict state separation is vital for security, but it also makes functions such as key backup or support for accessing the same canister seamlessly from multiple devices tedious, since all those operations have to be performed separately for each canister. We resolve this issue by using the identity provider which is similar to the sign in with big tech functionality that you certainly know from the web. When a user first loads the front end of a given canister, that front end can present a sign in with the IC button. When the user clicks that button, the browser is redirected to the internet computer identity provider, a specific application that allows the user to manage their keys and identities. In the identity provider, the user can then decide whether to allow the canister front end to use the identity. If the user approves, the browser is redirected to the canister front end and can access the canister under the user's identity. The identity provider mechanism again uses the session key and delegation mechanisms. The canister front end generates a session key pair and transfers the public key to the identity provider with the redirection. The identity provider if the user confirms, generates a delegation and returns it to the canister front end. As an additional benefit over sign in with big tech, the complete authentication flow in the identity provider happens on the user side, so there is much less exposure of private user actions and thus much less tracking. If you followed closely, you may have seen a possible security issue with the delegation mechanism we introduced. Suppose a user is using their identity to access two different applications, one secure application, such as online banking, and one potentially less secure application, such as an online game the user is playing casually. Now consider the front end served from one canister, such as the online game, and consider the case where the user uses the identity provider for delegation to that canister front end. If the delegation issued to that canister front end is valid for all backend canisters, 
then the front-end canister of that less secure application, the online game, would also be valid for accessing all canisters of the secure application in the user's name. The solution for this is scoping delegations. In particular, we scope each delegation to only contain exactly those canisters necessary to run the given front-end applications. The delegations we introduced are a powerful mechanism for user key management. I want to show one example of a delegation structure that is enabled by this scheme. On the left-hand side, we begin with the user's master key from which the user's identity is derived. This key is ideally held in secure storage, such as a hardware wallet. The master key is used only infrequently. For each of the user's devices, one device key is generated in the identity provider and the user's master key delegates to that device key. That device key would ideally use web authentication. Finally, the identity provider delegates from the device key to session keys that are specific to the canisters requested by the user and generally have a short validity. In terms of concrete cryptographic signature schemes, we support ADD25519, which is a modern scheme that starts to be more and more supported on the internet. We also support ECDSA on two different curves. We support the NIST curve P256, because that is widely supported in, in end devices that is used for web authentication and for web cryptography. We also support the Koblitz curve or Bitcoin curve SEGP256K1, which is used widely in the blockchain space. The structures I've shown here are examples of how the identity and authentication mechanisms of the internet computer can be used in applications. The mechanisms are described in detail in the Internet Computer Interface specification that we released recently, and we're looking forward to seeing what else our developer community is going to build from it. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a lot of fun building on the Internet Computer. <laughs>